In 1846, James Polk, the U.S. President, authorized the Army to recruit 500 Mormons to join their forces in the war with Mexico. After encouragement from their leader, Brigham Young, 500 men enlisted for one year of service. Departing from Council Bluffs, Iowa in July, they headed for Santa Fe and subsequently the Pacific Ocean, over 2,000 miles away. Before long, their orders were changed from a combat mission to a road-building operation. The government was keenly interested in a southern route to California, as the northern route was impassable up to nine months of each year due to snow in the mountains. To complete their monumental task, the battalion took 25 wagons and road-building equipment and created 700 miles of new road between New Mexico and California. In 1846, in what is now central Arizona, the Mormons met villages of Pima Indians and a very large community of Copa Indians. Both groups were friendly with them and guided them along the Gila River. On Christmas Day, they traveled 18 miles and camped away from water at a dry camp, which is the starting place for the hike described here. West of the Gila River, the route into California was so dry and desolate that the soldiers and stock animals had to march long distances without water as quickly as possible in order to survive. During that part of the march, rations were limited, many stock animals gave out, and the soldiers had to improvise new boots out of hide leather. The battalion reached San Diego on July 29, 1847, where they were commended by their commanding officer, Colonel Cook, for completing the longest infantry march in history. The new road became a route to California and the Butterfield stage was operated on the route twice weekly from 1858 to 1861. The outbreak of the Civil War in 1861 caused the mail delivery to be rerouted, but by 1866 the route was in use again by Wells Fargo, who had taken over the Butterfield business. When the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869, the stage route became a thing of the past. Prior to all of the above, Juan Batista de Anza, captain of the Presidio at Tucson, led an expedition of colonists and soldiers toward San Francisco. There were 240 people and over 1,000 head of livestock in this caravan. They traveled through the Butterfield Pass in the fall of 1775. The San Antonio and San Diego Overland Mail Line, also known as the Jackass Mail, because it often used mules on their stages, was the earliest overland stagecoach and mail operation from the eastern United States to California. It was an operation between 1857 and 1861. James Birch was the founder of the San Antonio and San Diego Overland Mail Line. Born November 30, 1827 in South Carolina, he moved to Providence, Rhode Island in 1847, where he worked in a livery stable and then as a stage driver for Otis H. Kelton. On July 1, 1857, the Post Office Department awarded the first transcontinental mail contract, number 8076, to James Birch. The contract stated, Contract made with said Birch from July 1, 1857, at $149,000 per annum for semi-monthly service to commence July 1, 1857 and expire June 30, 1861. Leave San Antonio on the 9th and 24th of each month at 6 a.m. Arrive San Diego in 30 days. Leave San Diego on the 9th and 24th of each month at 6 a.m. Arrive San Antonio in 30 days. Although the purpose of the contract was to establish a land route for delivering mail to California, the long-term plan was to put in place a more efficient trail for immigrants to help settle the West and to act as a forerunner for the eventual building of a transcontinental railroad. In 1857, Isaiah C. Woods was chosen as superintendent of the San Antonio and San Diego Overland Mail Line. Woods had been an employee of Adams Express Company in San Francisco. The Adams Express Company had financial difficulties during the banking crisis of 1854 to 1855. A large amount of money was unaccounted for, and about that time Woods left for Australia. Although he was never charged with taking the money, the suspicion remained. 
The contract changed ownership before the line started service. Birch left California on August 20, 1857, before the first successful delivery of the mail by the San Antonio and San Diego Overland Mail Line to be with his wife, Julia, and to oversee the completion of the building of their mansion. On September 12, he was on the sidewheeler ship Central America, about 400 miles south of Cape Hatteras, when a vibe split the ship's seams. Birch had refused the offer of a life belt as the ship was sinking, and a survivor relayed Birch's last words, No, Gabe, it's no use, as he strode away, smoking a cigar whose glow he fully intended should be extinguished with the breath of his life. life. The San Antonio-San Diego Overland Mail Line, the Jackass Mail, was the earliest overland stagecoach and mail operation from the eastern United States to California. It was in operation from 1857 to 1861. The animal produced by crossing a male donkey and a female horse, a mare, is called a mule, that is, a jackass or jack. The San Antonio-San Diego mail line often used jackass mules on their stages. The stage left San Antonio with I.C. Woods on board the 9th of August, 1857, reaching Maricopa Wells the evening of August 31st. The following day, he witnessed the last Indian war between the Yuma tribes and the Maricopa and Pima Indians. The following is an excerpt from the journal of I.C. Woods on the inaugural SASD mail run. September 1st. Camp for breakfast at the Maricopa Wells, which we have since selected as the site for our station. Remained at the Wells until 3 p.m., waiting for our agent to come up, whom I yesterday left behind on the road. Finally, he came along, and we prepared for a start. While camping at the Wells, I was witness to the largest Indian battle of the times. The Yuma Indians, aided by the Mojave and Tonto Apache as their allies, attacked the Maricopa just before daylight this morning. The Maricopa and Pima are allied strongly together, the former being comparatively few in numbers and rather under the protection of the more numerous Pima. The Maricopa are the more western of the two tribes, and as the Yuma approached from down the river, their villages were consequently the first attacked. Some warriors and their families were killed, and their huts fired before the presence of the Yuma was known. We saw the huts blazing and thought they were signal fires. Besides warriors on foot, every Indian that could get a horse was in the fight, many of them going a half dozen miles to reach the battleground. One, one aged chief, whose wife had been killed by the Yumas, rode furiously up to our camp, foaming at the mouth, and begging for us in good Spanish to aid them against the Yuma. Of course, we declined. When the battle was over, he refused to speak or understand a word of Spanish. The print fight was along the bank of the Gila, not half a mile from our camp. 104 Yuma left their villages at the junction of the Gila and Colorado, led on by a young and ambitious chief whose new dignity required some striking act to dazzle his people. He and 93 of his warriors were killed within a half hour on the side of a hill in plain view from the spot where I was reclining under a tree. At this place, the river makes what is termed the Big Bend of the Gila. The road lies nearly due east and west, while the river makes a horseshoe, probably four times as long as the distance from the Maricopa to Tazatal, at which place the road touches the river again. By the schedule of distances, you will perceive it is 40 miles from Maricopa to Tazatal. We started from Maricopa Wells at 3 p.m. and drove all night, reaching Tazatal, Casa Grande, for our breakfast camp a little after sunrise. Made 69 miles today. Only three relay stations, San Antonio, El Paso, and San Diego, had substantial buildings. The largest and most important station between El Paso and San Diego was at Maricopa Wells, Arizona the dividing point on the route, where the eastbound and westbound mails met and turned back to their or origin. 
Here was erected an adobe house in Corral. During the company's existence, it employed 65 men in all capacities and owned 50 coaches and 400 mules. On September 20, 1858, the Butterfield Company commenced operation of stages over the road blazed by James Birch from El Paso, Texas to Warner's Ranch, San Diego, California. The Butterfield Overland Mail Line route swung directly into the wheel tracks of the earlier line. It is the general belief that the San Antonio-San Diego Mail Line was absorbed by the Butterfield Overland Mail Line. On December 1, 1858, the portion of the route between El Paso and Fort Yuma was cut from the San Antonio-San Diego line services because it duplicated the service over the section of the newly inaugurated Butterfield Overland Mail Company. The service on the other two ends, however, from San Antonio to El Paso and from Fort Yuma to San Diego was improved from semi-monthly to a weekly trip and its subsidy was increased. During the year 1860, the west end of the route from Fort Yuma to San Diego was sliced from the service, thus leaving nothing of the original route but the 367-mile portion of the east end from San Antonio to Camp Stockton, Texas, which was put on a weekly basis. Between 1789, when the federal government of the United States began, and 1860, the United States population grew from about 4 million people to more than 31 million. Its territory extended into the Midwest in 1787 through the Northwest Ordinance and reached down the Mississippi River and west to the Rocky Mountains after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Until the 1840s, American emigration to California was a mere trickle, but two events in 1848 opened the floodgates. In early February 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo officially ended the Mexican-American War, ceding more than half of Mexico's former territory to the United States. This included what is now the entire southwestern United States from Texas to California. On September 15, 1815-57, businessman and financier John Butterfield of Utica, New York, won a coveted six-year, $600,000 a year federal contract to transport mail twice a week between St. Louis, Missouri and San Francisco in 25 days. At the time, it was the largest land mail contract ever awarded in the United States, requiring mail deliveries year-round. Before then, the fastest service across the continent had been provided by the San Antonio and San Diego mail line across approximately 1,475 miles of desert and mountains between the two points in about 52 days. That service had been organized by James Birch and begun months earlier in July and August 1857. A Butterfield Overland Mail Company Celerity Wagon 1858 drawing by William Hayes Hilton is a good representation showing the wild mules used to pull the stage wagons on the rougher sections of the trail. Some wild horses were also used. Wild mules were often used and were a constant problem. This style of stage, known as a stage wagon, was used from Los Angeles to Fort Smith, Arkansas. Butterfield organized and operated stations along the mail route that covered approximately 2,800 miles across the country. Conductors rode on top of the stagecoaches with the driver and had complete control of all mail and passengers. His word was the law. Butterfield Overland Mail, officially the Overland Mail Company, was a stagecoach service in the United States operating from 1858 to 1861. It carried passengers in U.S. mail from two eastern termini, Memphis, Tennessee, and St. Louis, Missouri, to San Francisco, California. The routes from each eastern terminus met at Fort Smith, Arkansas, and then continued through Indian Territory, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Mexico, and California, ending in San Francisco. On March 3, 1857, Congress authorized the U.S. Postmaster General, at that time Aaron V. Brown, 
to contract for delivery of the U.S. mail from St. Louis to San Francisco. Prior to this, U.S. mail bound for the Far West had been delivered by the San Antonio and San Diego mail line, known as the Jackass Mail, since June of 1857. The Butterfield Overland Mail Company operated from 1858 to 1861 under contract with the U.S. Postal Department, providing transportation of U.S. mail between St. Louis, Missouri and San Francisco, California. The route proposed by the Butterfield Mail Company became known as the Oxbow Route because of its shape on a map, starting in St. Louis and then dipping southwesterly through Missouri, western Arkansas, and the Indian Territory, turning west across Texas and southern New Mexico and Arizona, and then curving north in California to finish at San Francisco. On its maiden route, the Butterfield Stagecoach stopped at the small village of Tucson and continued to Maricopa Wells, a traditional stopover for emigrant wagon trains before the 40 mile stretch to Gila Bend without water. Maricopa Wells was most prosperous in the 1870s. During this time, the wells provided water and food for not only the east-west travelers, but also for those who traveled north toward Prescott. Fairly good roads to all points north had been built by the proprietor at Maricopa Wells, James Armour Moore. Maricopa Wells became a constant hub of activity with its ample supply of water and prosperous trading center. The Wells was a shining beacon and sanctuary in the desert for those thousands of travelers who depended upon its resources for their survival. As scheduled, mail started from each end of the 2,800 mile long stretch on September 16, 1858. The passenger fare was $200, about $6,000 in $221. The first westbound trip was made in about 24 days. On its westward maiden journey, one of the passengers was a New York Herald special correspondent named Waterman Ormsby, who would report his experiences in a series of articles. In Springfield, Missouri, Ormsby reported that the mail party switched from a Concord stagecoach to a stronger canvas-topped wagon. Travelers were in constant motion day and night over the rough terrain, stopping only for meals or to switch out stock or equipment at stations placed from 9 to 60 miles apart. On approaching a station, the conductor would blow a horn so fresh mules or horses would be ready and waiting. Early in the trip, Ormsby noted, We had now gone 243 miles through, I think, some of the roughest part of the country on the route. I find roughing it on plains agrees with me. Ormsby wrote of his travels through Arizona. I here saw some of the largest cactus plants on the route. They tower up from 12 to 15 feet in some of the varieties. Very excellent and sweet syrup is made from them. John Butterfield organized and operated stations along the Overland Mail Route that covered approximately 2,800 miles across the country. Conductors rode on top of the stagecoaches with the driver and had complete control of all mail and passengers. His word was the law. From 1858 to 1861, there were few westward routes, and it was imperative to keep the Overland Mail Company route open for settlers, miners, and businessmen traveling west. The government assigned a detachment from the 9th Kansas Cavalry to guard the route between Independence, Missouri, and California. It was forbidden to ship any vessels on the Overland Mail Company stages, as shown in John Butterfield's Order No. 8, the company's special instructions issued to all employees. No money, jewelry, banknotes, or valuables of any nature will be allowed to be carried under any circumstances whatever. For this reason, no Overland Mail Company stage on the Southern Trail was ever held up by outlaws. However, an article in the True West magazine, January 2021, states, The Butterfield Overland stage did come under Apache attack on at least two occasions. One attack was at Steins Pass, near the Arizona and, Arizona and New Mexico border, where they fired upon the coach, killing the driver and conductor. Three others were dragged off the stage and killed. During the infamous Bascom affair in February 1860, the eastbound stage, with 11 on board from Tucson, came under attack from Cochise's warriors as they passed the end of Apache Pass. 
Two men were hit along with two mules. The Apaches had also removed the planks from, from a small bridge over which the wheels ran in hopes of wrecking the stage. The two mules were cut loose and the stage rambled on toward the stage station. When they came to the bridge, the carriage belly, belly slid across the bridge and limped on into the station. Another group, the well-armed Free Thompson Party, came under attack in the spring of 1861 at Doubtful Canyon, also near the Arizona and New Mexico line. Heavily outnumbered, all were finally killed, but not before some 45 warriors with them. Cochise later said, They were the bravest men he ever knew or heard of, that if all his band were equal in bravery and endurance, he would undertake to whip the whole United States. There is another account, an alternate history perhaps. In 2013, Gerald Arnhart wrote in his book, The Construction of the Butterfield Trail in Eastern Arizona. No Butterfield stage was ever held up by outlaws, and no one on the stages was ever killed during the company's service on the Southern Overland Trail. Only once was the stage attacked by Indians, and that was in a pass, February 4, 1861. The conductor suffered a bullet wound to his leg. Maricopa has had three locations over the years, and each stage of its life has contributed greatly to the growth and development of the Southwest. Maricopa's first location was Maricopa Wells, a small watering hole just west of Pima Butte and south of the Gila River. It existed prior to Father Kino's many visits to the area in the late 1600s. In the 1800s, it served as a famous relay station and trading center for the Butterfield Overland Stage Line and a refuge for all east-west travelers. No matter to what area of the Arizona Territory a traveler wanted to go, he had to pass through Maricopa Wells. As scheduled, mail started from each end of the 2,800-mile-long stretch on September 16, 1858. The passenger fare was $200. That would be about $6,000 in, in 2021. The first westbound trip was made in about 24 days. In 2021, that same 2,800-mile Amtrak train trip coach fare is $188, and the trip takes about three days. During the 1800s, Maricopa Wells was one of the most important relay stations along the San Antonio-San Diego mail line and the more famous Butterfield Overland Mail Route. Although little remains of this once bustling community, it played an important part in the progress and development of the Southwest. It was one of the best known spots in Arizona during this period because it not only had a reliable source of water, but offered an abundance of food thanks to the peaceful Pima and Maricopa farmers who lived and farmed nearby. Arizona Indians have refused transfer of Maricopa Wells' historic stagecoach station site for park purposes in Pinal County. In replying to request of state legislature, the Indians declared they already had taken steps to preserve Maricopa Wells and suggested the state might help by building a road to the site. Here's a wonderful photograph of the Maricopa Wells 20 mule train about 1861. Great freight trains that had three or four wagons and eight to twenty mules were often camped at the wells. These trains carried goods from east to west and stopped at most key points in northern Arizona. Immigrants and military union troops used the area for camping grounds, wagon repairs, and supplies. The camping ground outside the enclosure was a busy place. Great freight trains were often camped there, and detachments of soldiers from a few scouts to one or more companies might turn in for the night. Soldiers scouting through the immediate country usually made Maricopa Wells their supply station. All westbound traffic, whether or not they camped, had to load up with enough water to last across the desert from Maricopa to Gila Bend, a distance of 45 miles, which meant at least one night's camp. The population at Maricopa Wells included James Armour Moore, his wife Jane, son Arthur, twin daughters Susan and Clara, and a stepson, John Crampton. The Wells housed several other people also who were employees or rented rooms. There was a telegraph operator for the government line, 
and a telegraph line rider who was also a soldier. One employee was a teamster who hauled supplies and other goods for the station. The hostler was in charge of the stage horses, and the blacksmith not only took care of the stage horses, but also hired out to do blacksmith work such as shoeing and wagon repair. There was a cook, a roustabout, and a herder who lived and worked at the wells. The herder was also a butcher for the compound, and he ran about 50 head of cattle that supplied meat for the restaurant and the store. One day a farmer from Peoples Valley, which is near Prescott, came to the wells. He asked about a favorite food he had heard about called macaroni. He wanted to buy all the macaroni the store had. At that time, macaroni sold by the bulk and came in wooden boxes that weighed about 10 pounds each. The store had several of these boxes. Emerson Stratton, an employee of Wells, was curious as to why this farmer wanted so much macaroni. The farmer said that almost anything could grow on his ranch, and he wanted to experiment with macaroni to see if it would grow there also. It took a lot of talking to convince this man that one did not grow macaroni. James Armour Moore was born in Portsmouth, England in 1825. An adventurer at heart, he whaled at sea and explored the Panama area before moving to California. Recognizing the possibilities in Arizona, he mined at La Paz and Vulture before operating the sutler store at Fort McDowell in 1865 and 66. His next move took him to Camp Reno on Tonto Creek, 1867 and 1869, before moving his family to Maricopa Wells in 1870. In 1870, when Maricopa Wells Station was purchased by well-known pioneers James A. Moore and Larkin Clark, it had become what may be called America's first mini-mall, with a general store, saloon, staff living quarters, an office, a blacksmith shop, stables, and a hotel, all in one long U-shaped building surrounding a two-acre square, enclosed by a high adobe wall open on one end. The Wells, famous for its hospitality and fine kitchen fare, was probably the only place between Texas and California where a good hot meal was served to the traveler, often with live music provided by Moore's twin daughters. Moore formed a partnership with Larkin W. Clark at Maricopa Wells and they became proprietors of this business during its most prosperous years. A smooth road was built up north to Prescott that made travel more pleasant. Telegraph lines and a mail route was established from Maricopa Wells to Phoenix. This was of great benefit to the entire Salt River Valley because it provided east-west mail communication using the overland stages. In addition, Maricopa Wells was the division point for Phoenix, Fort McDowell, and other places to the north. Much traffic to and from the mining areas north of the Salt River Valley followed this route and depended upon Maricopa Wells for water and supplies. After the coming of the railroad in 1887, Moore became interested in mining and relocated to Globe to help develop a series of mines in that area. Failing health forced Moore back to California where he died. He was buried in Laurel Hill Cemetery in 1883. However, this cemetery no longer exists because San Francisco lawmakers decreed that cemeteries were no longer allowed within city limits. Moore's remains were reportedly relocated to Cypress Hill in Colma. James Arthur Moore was the son of Matilda, Jane, Burnett, Crampton Moore, and James Armour Moore. He was born August 10, 1866 in San Bernardino, California. He and his parents moved to Fort McDowell, Arizona in 1868, where his dad conducted a sutler store, that's Army Supplies. Settlers, frequently the only suppliers of non-military goods, often developed monopolies on critical commodities like alcohol, tobacco, coffee, and sugar, and rose to powerful stature. Since government-issued coinage was scarce during the Civil War, settlers often conducted transactions using a particular type of Civil War token known as a settler token. Settlers played a major role in the recreation of Army men between 1865 and 1890. Settler stores outside of military posts were usually also open to non-military travelers and offered gambling, drinking, and prostitution. In 1870, the family moved to Maricopa Wells, 
then the Globe in 1878, where his mother ran a hotel. His dad died in 1883 in San Francisco, and his mother in 1901 in Globe. According to the 1870 census, he was only three years old when his family moved to Maricopa Wells, and 13 when they moved to Globe. Growing up in the isolated desert of Arizona allowed young boys great spaces for exploring the wilderness. He fetched water from the nearby wells for his family and fished and trapped beavers and other animals in the nearby Gila River. He probably visited Henry Morgan, who lived on the north side of the Gila River and owned a store and ferry boat service. According to a descendants of Matilda Burnett Moore family tree, Arthur married Molly A. Shanley on September 21, 1891 in Globe, Arizona. They had two children, Maud and Clara Moore. James Arthur Moore died on February 15, 1946 in Phoenix, Arizona. John Franklin Crampton, son of Matilda Jane Crampton Moore, was born on December 1, 1860 in San Bernardino, California. He was eight years old when he became the first white child to settle in the Salt River Valley. His stepfather, James Armour Moore, operated the sutler store at Fort Fort McDowell. In the 1870s, the family moved to Maricopa Wells, where the Moores and Cars operated the Overland Stage Station for several years. Young John kept a journal of his life at the Wells. He recalled, It took five days and nights to travel by stagecoach from Tucson to San Diego, for a fare of $90. Stagecoaches averaged about five miles per hour. Greenbacks were worth only 60 cents on the dollar, and nearly everything was paid in gold or silver. Meals at the stage station were a dollar. The stages would lose one or two hours at each station where they changed horses. The wagon would be greased, meals would be prepared for six to eight men, and the horses changed. One schedule and fare chart listed in the Tucson, Arizona Citizen in 1876 gave the following information. Tucson to Florence, $8. To Maricopa Wells, $18. To Phoenix, $20. To Prescott, $40. To Yuma, $40. To San Diego, $50. To San Francisco, $65. As a young adult, Crampton became interested in mining and relocated in Globe, where he became instrumental in mining development of Arizona. He died April 21, 1947, in Phoenix, Arizona. According to John Franklin Crampton Moore, Native American farmers often exchanged their farming products for balatas, possibly muskets, and tickets payable in merchandise at the Maricopa Wells store. One day, Maricopa Charlie came to the store and seeing some hoops hanging up, asked about their use. He was told white ladies wore them under their skirts, and Mr. Moore demonstrated how they fit around the waist. Charlie wore an old plug hat and G-string. He was intrigued with the hoop and bought it, and bought a large green green umbrella that caught his fancy. He fastened the hoop to his waist, and with the green umbrella hoisted over his head, he paraded these new fashions for four hours to the amusement of his friends, and everyone else at Maricopa Wells. In the spring of 1865, Governor John N. Goodwin received federal authorization to recruit volunteers for service within the Arizona Territory. Because the Pima and Maricopa Indians living along the Gila River had enthusiastically assisted the troops in earlier actions against Apaches, some of them were enlisted for the campaign. On May 31, General George S. Mason wrote Colonel Richard C. Drum, Adjutant General of Department of California, that Juan Cheveria, the Maricopa chief and a fine warrior, would probably furnish a hundred good soldiers. The chief would lead them himself, but did not wish to enter the service as an enlisted man. Instead of other compensation, he wanted to visit San Francisco with one or two of his people. Instead, Antonio Azul, chief of the Pima, and Irataba, chief of the Mojave, had both made trips to the city with with civilian friends. Juan Chiveria, Mason wrote, naturally feels slighted and neglected. In view of the trifling cost of such a journey and the considerable potential benefits, Mason requested authority to send Juan Chiveria and his companions to drum barracks 
by some returning wagon train. He asked that the commanding officer of this post be directed to send them on to San Francisco and that they be cared for while in the city. An unsigned endorsement on Mason's letter read, Muster them in as officers and send them as such to San Francisco, and then all their expenses can be borne. After, if they wish to resign, they will be allowed to do so. Suggest this to Governor Goodwin. At Maricopa Wells on September 2nd, Company B of the Arizona Volunteers was mustered in with Juan Cheveria as its captain. First Lieutenant Thomas R. Ewing and Second Lieutenant Charles Reet com completed the roster of officers. The company had 96 enlisted men on scouting expeditions, but more often than not, about 150 Maricopans participated. Officially, the company took station at Fort McDowell. The post returns showed Captain Cheveria on detached service at Maricopas, his tribe's principal village, except when Company B was in the field looking for Apaches. Pima Chief Antonio Azuli, 1805-1876 Chief Antonio Azul was the last traditional chief, traditional chief of the Gila River Indian community. Chief Azul is significant in the decision for the tribe to remain in its traditional territory despite the efforts of the U.S. government to move the tribe to Oklahoma, like so many others. Today he is described as a historical, spiritual, and cultural figure who acted as a warrior, statesman, ambassador, and moral authority in his time. In 1865 and 1866, Pima and Maricopa and Hispanic soldiers served in the 1st USA Arizona Volunteer Infantry. John D. Walker was commissioned as 1st Lieutenant and A. Hancock as 2nd Lieutenant of Company C, made up of Pima Indians. Their chief, Antonio Azul, was made a sergeant and 89 Pima were recruited to fill out the company. Five more Pima were added later at Sacaton. Emerson Oliver Stratton was born in New York in 1846 and moved to Arizona in 1875. He was a clerk and bookkeeper at Maricopa Wells at one time and wrote about his first encounter with the Wells in his journal, Reminiscence of E.O. Stratton. Stratton remembered it was in the fall of 1875 that he left his job as a house builder in San Diego, California and moved to Arizona to make his fortune panning for gold in the Graham Mountains of Arizona. He had heard of a wonderful gold discovery in the Graham Mountains in Arizona from H.C. Hooker. Hooker was one of the largest cattle owners in Arizona at that time. However, on the way to Arizona, he heard about a job at Maricopa Wells with a James A. Moore. Moore had the Tucson to Yuma division of the Overland Stage Company mail contract and needed a clerk and bookkeeper. Stratton traveled in a four-horse mud wagon stage to Maricopa Wells. It was called that because it was lighter than the other wagons. It had only two seats and could accommodate five passengers instead of 16 as the larger stages did. The coach was canvas covered with a seat outside for the driver and two seats inside facing each other. Stratton said the horses trotted or ran 20 miles to the next relay station where fresh teams were hitched up and ready to go to the next stretch. He said it was a long, hard, and tiresome trip. Upon his arrival at Maricopa Wells, Stratton expected to find it was a typical stage station consisting of one building, but it was a whole town in itself. He said the one-room-wide adobe building ran around three sides, and a high adobe wall completed the fourth side of a great hollow square, which enclosed about two acres. He described it as having huge wooden gates, which opened for teams, and a smaller door in one of those gates for people. Only the office and store had outside openings. The store, saloon, office, and living quarters faced the road, and all rooms had dirt floors. Along the right side were the hotel and a restaurant with meals which could be purchased for a dollar. On the opposite side of the compound were the stables and blacksmith shop. In the middle of the enclosed area was a huge stack of wild hay. Stratton signed a contract to stay at Maricopa Wells for six months. James Armour Moore had trouble hiring and keeping employees. Stratton said some came just for the ride and disappeared into the desert to look for gold, 
and others soon lost heart because the work was tedious, boring, and involved much dreaded government red tape and complicated reports. Or they left because of the loneliness of such an isolated place, or feared the vast and strange barren country. Stratton had worked hard at the wells and had learned much, but he was anxious to follow his dream of prospecting in Arizona. He said all during his stay at Maricopa, he was mind crazy and longed to pursue this dream. However, it would be another two months before he was free to seek his fortune in the hills of Arizona. After he left Maricopa Wells, Stratton operated the Stratton Mines near Mount Lemmon. Among the most notable of the early pioneers of Arizona was King S. Woolsey. He was a native of Alabama, but was raised to manhood in Louisiana, from which state he emigrated to California when only 18 years of age. He came into Arizona Territory in 1860 in company with, with Mr. Benedict of Tucson and Colonel Jackson, who settled in Yavapai County. When they landed in Yuma, the only money they had between them was $5 belonging to King Woolsey. In addition, they each had a horse and were armed with a rifle and, and a pistol. They had ridden all the way from below San Francisco into Arizona Territory. Woolsey's first occupation in Arizona was that of a mule driver. He then became the owner of a mule team and made contracts for the delivery of hay and other supplies to the government. Later, he engaged in partnership with George Martin, who afterwards lived at Yuma, and they purchased the Agua Caliente Ranch. When Albert Sidney Johnson's party came across the territory on their way to join the Confederates, Woolsey joined them. But when they reached Maricopa Station, he was taken down with smallpox and was left behind. He was watched as a secessionist for some time thereafter, but never took any part in the civil strife. The Texan invasion found him actively engaged in private business. The creation of the Democratic Party in Arizona Territory was largely due to Woolsey's efforts. Since its creation by a Republican-dominated Congress in 1863, the Republicans had controlled Arizona politics. Woolsey called a meeting of like-minded Democrats in February 1873 in Tucson. Presiding at the meeting, he introduced a series of resolutions which led to the organization of the Democratic Party in the Arizona Territory. He was the Democratic candidate for territorial delegate to the U.S. Congress in the 1878 election, but was defeated. Woolsey died of a heart attack at his Agua Fria ranch in 1879. He was 47 years old. He is buried in Pioneer and Military Memorial Park in Phoenix. King S. Woolsey was, in all respects, a big man. He was a typical Westerner, bold, resolute, and energetic. A natural leader of men, he was successful not only in his Indian expeditions, but also in his business enterprises. His activities were known and felt in all parts of the territory up to the time of his untimely death. Among the early pioneers of Arizona, he stands out as the most conspicuous figure of them all. Woolsey took a Yaqui woman named Lucy Martinez as a mistress, and they had a daughter named Conception. Woolsey also had a biological daughter, Clara Woolsey, who Woolsey did not recognize as legitimately his. Clara had two children, Julio and Clara. Woolsey was about 47 when he died of heart disease in Phoenix at his Lyle Ranch, June 29, 1879. At the time of his death, he was serving as director in several water companies aimed at benefiting farmers by more equitable distribution of water privileges. He was laid to rest in the western part of the old Phoenix Cemetery beneath a stone marker which reads, He braved the dangers and hardships of frontier life for 19 years, with success and the hero of many battles with the Apaches in Arizona. Maricopa chief Juan Chiveria wept like a child at the loss of his friend and accompanied by almost all the males of his tribe attended the funeral. Matilda Jane Burnett Crampton Moore. Her maiden name was Matilda J. Burnett and she was born in Charleston, South Carolina on August 10, 1836. Her parents died when she was a child. In 1851, when she was just 15 and in the company with her brother, she started with a party of immigrants on a long overland journey to California. Her brother died while they were crossing the plains of Texas, leaving her entirely alone. In the same wagon train were the Oatman family, 
who, dissatisfied with the slow progress they were making, pushed on ahead and were massacred by Indians between Maricopa Wells and Yuma. After a journey of more than a year, the party reached San Bernardino, California, where she met and married John Crampton in 1852. They had four children. In 1860, John died. The following year, she married James A. Moore. They had two children. In 1868, they left all the children except John under the care of a relative and moved to Fort McDowell, Arizona Territory, where James ran a sutler store, a civilian merchant who sells provisions to the army. In 1870, after disposing of his business, they moved to Maricopa Wells, where James took charge of the Overland stage line between Tucson and Yuma. Matilda went to California and put her children in school, returned to Maricopa Wells, and assumed the management of the station. The family moved to Globe in 1878. James engaged in mining, but his investments did poorly and he lost his money. He died in 1883. In 1878, Matilda and her son John purchased the property where she lived until her death, erecting a frame building where they conducted the Central Hotel. The building and contents were destroyed in the Great Fire of June 1892. Although left almost penniless, Matilda set up to work to recoup the loss, which she was able to do partially by mortgaging her ground and erecting a lodging house. The income was sufficient in a few years to liquidate her indebtedness. She contracted a severe case of grip, or influenza, which turned to pneumonia. Finally, Bright's disease set in, affecting her kidneys, and she died on February 8, 1901, in Globe, Arizona. Mary Ellen Crampton Moore Fitzgerald was born in 1856 in California and moved with her family to Maricopa Wells in the late 1860s. She and her sisters were sent to a boarding school in California taught by sister of Charles Poston. Charles Poston, sometimes called the father of Arizona, due to his prominent role in procuring Arizona's territory status. It was here that she was taught not only academic subjects, but had the opportunity to study French, dancing, art, embroidery, and music. Girls had dance programs and men queued up to ask for dances. In turn, the girl entered his name next to the number of the dance they would share. That's where dance cards came from. It was not uncommon for girls to marry 16 years or younger in the late 1800s. Mary Ellen married Henry T. Fitzgerald, May 1, 1874, in Maricopa, Arizona. They had three children, Henry, Matilda, and Anna. It is not known when she died, but an article in the 1930s about her brother-in-law, Charles Kenyon, mentions that she was a widow at the time and living in San Francisco. Mary Ellen Crampton's marriage is also under the name Moore. She married Henry T. Fitzgerald in Maricopa County, Arizona, and he was a resident of Yuma County. Mary Ellen resided in Maricopa Wells, Pinnell County. A comment on the record states that Mary is the daughter of James A. Moore. It is interesting that the girls were willing to go by the name of their new father, and John kept his real father's name. However, it is also possible that it was assumed that James Moore was the girl's father since their real father had died before the family even arrived in Arizona. Since John married a decade after his sisters, maybe he was able to establish his true parentage. The girls may have even been less concerned because they expected their names to change when they married anyway. The words of James M. Barney in an Arizona Highways article in 1936 described the tiny frontier settlement of Maricopa Wells. No more historic spot exists in all this southwestern country than the site that once, in an now far away distant day, was the lively and flourishing stage station of Maricopa Wells. Clara Ann Moore and her twin, Susan Moore, were born on May 2, 1863, in San Bernardino, California. While growing up at Maricopa Wells, Clara and her twin often entertained dinner guests by singing songs. Clara married George Parsons Scholefield, who was born May 21, 1860, in Utica, New York. This young couple was married in about 1882 and had five children. Clara died November 27, 1947, in Tucson, Arizona. George died in Tucson August 31, 1942. Susan's full siblings were Clara, her twin, and James Arthur Moore. Susan married Charles T. Connell of San Carlos in Pinal County, Arizona on May 20, 1882. 
She gave birth to three children. Frances S. is listed as the first white child born at San Carlos on March 11, 1883. Henrietta was born on September 23, 1885, followed by twin brothers who died upon birth on May 4, 1891, in Pima, Arizona. Another brother, Robert Moore Connell, was born on July 4, 1893. Susan died on February 20, 1895. The Moore twins, Clara and Susan, were popular throughout the Arizona Territory and especially along the southern Overland Road from Tucson to Yuma. They were known for their sense of liveliness and fun-loving spirit. They loved to dance and the newspapers frequently spoken of their charm and paltritude. When older, they were sent to a distinguished finishing school in San Francisco, California. This school was operated by the sister of the father of Arizona, Charles Poston. This obituary appeared in the Arizona Weekly Citizen, March 2, 1895. It is with deep pain we announce the death of Susan A. Connell, wife of our esteemed fellow townsman, Charles T. Connell. She passed away last evening after a brief illness. Her death was wholly unexpected and came with a suddenness that startled the loving ones who watched her in the waning hours of life and strove with loving hands to avert the inevitable end. She was a good wife, a fond and doting mother whose loss to her bereaved household is irreparable. Her husband and three children, one of whom is 12 years of age and another nine years of age and other but 20 months have sympathy of the entire community. Mrs. Connell was the daughter of the late James A. Moore and was born in San Bernardino, California, May 2, 1863, and was consequently but 32 years of age, was educated in San Francisco and married in Globe in 1882. Her twin sister, Mrs. George Scholefeld, was with her at the time of her death. Her mother, Mrs. Moore, and sister, Mrs. C.H. Kenyon of Globe, are expected to arrive tonight. The funeral will take place from the Episcopal Church tomorrow at 2 p.m. Sarah Jane Crampton Moore Kenyon was born December 6, 1857 in Santa Cruz, California, and died December 14, 1957 in San Diego. 14-year-old Sarah Jane married Charles Kenyon of the Kenyon Stage Station on November 27, 1872. This young couple carries the title and honor of being the first white couple to be married in the Phoenix City limits. Sarah was almost 15 years old at the time. Their wedding was a special event and much celebrated at Maricopa Wells and throughout the valley. The wedding reception took place in the newly acquired Goldwater Building in two large rooms facing the southwest corner of the City Hall Plaza of Phoenix. This event was described as music by the 5th Cavalry Band was extremely good. The supper at the Capitol House was excellent. Dancing was kept up all night and the whole passed off very pleasantly. During the night, the bride and groom attracted much attention. The bride and her sister, dressed in white, moving in the giddy mazes of the dance, appeared visions of loveliness, and Mr. Kenyon, looking the picture of happiness, was pronounced the luckiest man living. Kenyon was born 1840 in New York and died February of 1906. Kenyon was a Pony Express rider and merchant at the Kenyon Stage Station and Cattlemen. He moved his family to Globe in 1879, where they lived until his death in 1906. Sarah Jane died 1957, living to be 100 years old and bearing witness to a treasure chest of memories and Arizona history. Maricopa Wells Conception took place at a series of watering holes eight miles north of present-day Maricopa and about a mile west of Pima Butte. It was called Maricopa Wells, where several of Arizona's rivers, the Gila, Santa Cruz, Veckel, and Santa Rosa, provided this oasis in the desert with an ample supply of water during this period. History enthusiast Charles McCoy Clark came to Arizona in 1872 as a telegraph operator. He worked as a merchant, newspaper publisher in Globe, an assayer in Jerome, and was also in mining in Globe, Arizona. Clark developed a Canyon Lake resort on the Apache Trail near Phoenix. In 1882, he was appointed Postmaster of Clifton and elected Justice of the Peace in 1923. He served on the board of the Arizona Historical Society and wrote many articles about Arizona history for the Arizona Republic and other publications. 
He was elected president of the Arizona Pioneers Association in 1923 and served in that capacity until his death at the Pioneers home in Prescott. His friend Charlotte Hall delivered the eulogy at his funeral. Charles M. Clark, born in Dubuque, Iowa on May 15, 1855. At the, age, at the age of 17, as a Western Union telegraph operator, he came to Arizona to build and operate military telegraph lines. He was assigned as the first telegraph operator at Maricopa Wells. In 1880, he married the former Dora E. Hall of San Francisco in Globe, Arizona. Clark said James Moore, the proprietor of Maricopa Wells, had to be gone a lot, and his wife Jane, who was called Aunt Jane from San Berdu, took care of the business. He remembered she was quite a character and well-known by everyone. Even though he had disagreements with her, he recalled several stories with fondness. I witnessed her on one occasion swinging an axe by the end of the handle, chase a big Missourian out of her corral, and then throw his shotgun after him. Many an old-timer, prospector, Stage driver or tramp remembered Aunt Jane with gratitude. No hungry man was ever turned from her door. She lived hard and worked hard. She laid down her burden in Globe in 1901. A good mother, a good friend, a square fighting enemy, a typical frontier woman of pioneer days in Arizona. Clark described the dining hall of the wells as very narrow and built of adobe with dirt floors. He remembered that it had a long, narrow table for the boarders with assigned seats for everyone. Clark was in for a case of culture shock when he discovered that there were different meals at two ends of the same long table. Aunt Jane and her children were at one end with the boarders at the other. The meals did not resemble one another in either taste or looks. He discussed this disparity with Aunt Jane and ended up out on his ear searching for creditable accommodations elsewhere. However, being a resilient individual of courage, ingenuity, and determination, Clark sought out the help of Henry Morgan, who lived and operated a ferry at the Gila River, and became quite independent in a short time. Clark's memoirs not only describe the buildings, but also give voice to the people and daily life at Maricopa Wells in the 1870s. Perry Williams owned and operated the Williams Hotel south of the railroad tracks in Maricopa. He served as the first mayor of Maricopa and is first justice of the peace. Williams was a businessman and politically well connected through his friendship with the first governor of Arizona, George W.P. Hunt. Governor Hunt served a total of seven terms. Perry Williams kept a bobcat tied up outside the post office of Hotel Williams for nine years. It was a favorite attraction of the tourists. Perry moved to Phoenix in 1914 after the fire destruction of Hotel Williams and sold his home and property moved to Long Beach, California in 1934. Perry died about 1948 at the age of 85. Perry Williams arrived in rural Maricopa at a time when it was just beginning to build its infrastructure as a railroad junction. Like most entrepreneurs, he recognized the opportunities available and was not afraid to take a risk. He immediately put his financial resources and experience to work building a hotel and stocking it with a nest of bobcats and beautiful basketry from the nearby Native American communities. He befriended the citizens of Maricopa and those throughout the territory and was popular with the newspapers and politicians alike in the Phoenix and Tucson areas. Not content with a thriving hotel business, he began to buy up land in Maricopa and brought well drilling companies into the area to explore the possibilities of growing crops. They bought his land at a handsome price, and he lay with money in the bank for new ventures in Phoenix. Williams bought several houses in Phoenix and invested heavily in the stock market, making a lot of money. However, the Great Depression of 1929 happened, and, like most Americans during this time, he was wiped out financially. Soon thereafter, he moved to, moved to California and faded into oblivion, except for an unexpected correspondence from his son years later, who assured everyone that Williams was back on his feet before long and doing quite well financially. James Addison Rivas 
later using the name James Addison Peralta Rivas, the so-called Baron of Arizona was an American forger and fraudster. He is best known for his association with the Peralta Land Grant, also known as the Barony of Arizona. These were a pair of fraudulent land claims which, if certified, would have granted him ownership of over 18,600 square miles of land in Central Arizona Territory and Western New Mexico Territory. During the course of the fraud, Rivas collected an estimated U.S. $5.3 million in cash and promissory notes, $163 million in present-day terms, through the use of quit claims and proposed investment plans. Under the terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Gadsden Purchase, the United States was required to recognize and honor existing land grants made by either the Spanish or Mexican governments. Rivas utilized this provision by manufacturing a fictional claim and then generating a collection of documents demonstrating how the claim came into his possession. The documents were then covertly inserted into various record archives. In his initial claim, Rivas claimed title to the grant via a series of conveyances. When serious challenges to his claim developed, Rivas developed a second claim by marrying the purported last surviving lineal descendant of the original claim recipient. During the course of his deception, Rivas convinced prominent people to support his efforts. He obtained legal and political support from Roscoe Conklin, Robert G. Ingersoll, and James Broadhead. Business leaders such as Charles Crocker and John W. McKay in turn provided financial support. Initial exposure of the fraud occurred when an unfavorable Surveyor General report caused the claim to be summarily dismissed. In response to this action, Rivas sued the U.S. government for $11 million in damages, $338 million in present-day terms. The suit, in turn, prompted the U.S. government to form a detailed investigation that fully exposed the forgeries that Rivas had planted in a variety of locations. On the map of the Peralta land grant in its final form, note the Maricopa and Phoenix Railroad, M and PRR. Antonio Azul was born in the year 1817 or 18. Where his father, Pima Chief Kula Azul, went, the son accompanied. What the father did, the son supported. They fought the Yuma and Mojave, depleting the enemy and strengthening their union with the Maricopa. To the white soldier or emigrant, they gave food, lodging, or escort, as condition required. As Kula Azul bowed to old age, tribal leadership was assumed by the well-trained son, Antonio. In 1857, Antonio Azul, at 40, headed the United Forces of Pima and Maricopa in a decisive battle against the Yuma and Mojave at Maricopa Wells in which it is said but three of 200 warriors escaped to tell the story of the battle. Not a few Indians among the victors and vanquished attribute the outcome to the favoritism of Montezuma, though nature's profile of him so near to, at the Estrella Mountains, whose silent tongue, closed eye, and deep ear could no longer permit tribal antipathies that cost many lives. Just what part the clear-cut gigantic profile Seen against the azure sky had on the warring hordes is conjectural. This much we do know. Antonio Azul, the victorious tribes, and union with the Maricopa was again strengthened. About 1871, a Pima tribe leader told this story. A few years ago, the Pima head chief, Antonio, was induced to visit Washington and our great eastern cities. He was much beloved and confided in the tribe, and the many months he was absent left a void in their midst. Sometimes unpleasant rumors were put in circulation that he was dead, and when the time approached that he was soon expected, the days and hours were counted with anxious solicitude. Finally, the glad news came that Antonio was coming, and but a few miles away, and large numbers hurried forth to welcome him home again, and there was joy throughout the tribe. After the excitement of meeting was over, the tribe gathered round to listen to his recital of the wonders he had seen. He told them of the immense oceans and rivers, of, un of untold thousands of ships sailing for months between given points at rapid speed, 
of the iron horse fed on wood and water, of the immense loads he drew, and how he finally flew over mountains and valleys and never tired, of curious machines by which men instantly talked to thousands of miles apart, of the immense towns and cities he had passed through, and of the countless thousands of men under arms, it was during our rebellion, that he had seen at one time. They listened in silence until he had finished and then waited for him to tell them that he was merely relating a fancy story, the creation of his own, of his own imagination. But Antonio remained serious, and when given an opportunity to regain his reputation for veracity, he firmly declared and insisted that every word he had said was true. Then the truth began to flash upon the Pima mind that by long contact with the whites, the tongue of their beloved chief had become forked and he was no longer to be believed. It was a sad day to the poor Pimas, and an unfortunate day for Antonio. He is still their chief, but he has never regained their entire confidence, though he studiously avoids relating any more of the marvelous things he saw during his travels. By 1879, the Southern Pacific Railroad reached Maricopa Wells as it raced east from San Francisco and Los Angeles, California. To be closer to the city of Phoenix, Maricopa Wells moved eight miles south to a new location named Maricopaville. This settlement was to be the junction of the Southern Pacific Railroad main line and a branch line connecting to Phoenix. Yet this second boom town was to be short-lived. It was soon decided to locate the junction a few miles east to present-day Maricopa. This was established to take advantage of rail connections to be constructed to Tempe and Phoenix. By 18, 1887, the line to Phoenix and Tempe was completed and Maricopa became a busy commercial center. Maricopa is currently the closest stop serving the Phoenix metropolitan area. The station consists of a double-wide modular building with a small waiting area and restrooms. In 1996, passenger service to Phoenix Union Station was discontinued due to poor track conditions. Funds could not be found to repair and upgrade the tracks, causing the Sunset Limited Texas Eagle to be rerouted to the south along the Southern Pacific's main line. Maricopa became the closest station to Phoenix, the Arizona capital, which is 25 miles to the north. Maricopa Wells became prominent in the 1850s when the first transcontinental mail line from San Antonio to San Diego used it as a key relay station for travelers moving east-west and north-south. Just as the community has had many town sites, so too has Maricopa had several station structures. The earliest was a two-story wooden building with deep eaves and prominent brick chimneys. Later raised, it was replaced in the 1930s by a small clapper depot that was later moved to Scottsdale's McCormick Stillman Railroad Park in 2004. In 2001, the town installed a vintage 1948 stainless steel domed observation lounge car known as the Silver Horizon that had been used on the California Zephyr trains. The rail car, which was originally held three double bedrooms, a drawing room with private shower, and a lounge for 50 passengers, became Maricopa's rail station, reconfigured to house offices. While it is no longer used as a station, the rail car remains on display at its nearby location on Casa Grande, Maricopa Highway, Route 238, for the delight of visitors. Incorporated in 2003, Maricopa is now one of the nation's fastest growing cities, offering access to the cultural riches of close by Phoenix, as well as local sites such as the Hem Doc Eco Museum, which chronicles the history and culture of the Ok Chin Indian community through art and crafts. Further afield, the visitor can explore Casa Grande Ruins Monument, a farming community and great house constructed by the Hohokam Indians during the 13th century. The first cultural and prehistoric site to be protected by the United States government, Casa Grande Ruins Monument was set aside in 1892 by President Benjamin Harrison. The passenger fare in 1858 was $200, from St. Louis to San Francisco. Equivalent today would be about $6,000. The first westbound trip was made in about 24 days. Today, in 2021, that same 2,800-mile Amtrak train trip coach fare is $188, and the trip takes about three days, 76 hours and 40 minutes to be exact.
Thank you for taking your valuable time to review this presentation. For more information about the Maricopa Historical Society, including membership and donations, please use the following link. Thank you.